okay, not sure yet, right? Judging me, I look like a cop or a detective, definitely got the dad on. But I promise you, it's not gonna be that bad. We're gonna get through this together. Um, my number one objective is just give you information. I know I'm old now, but I actually remember being in high school and I hated when people came in and were like, yeah, 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 you're gonna die, you're little kids, and scare tactics and like talking in a demeaning way to me. Like my sophomore year, I already thought I was a grown man. Like, don't talk to me like a little kid. I don't like that. So I want you to know that I'm going to give you that respect. I think you're young adults. You're the future. You're going to go on to the workforce. You're going to go on to college. Like, you're full-blown humans. You're not little kids, right? And so I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to threaten you. And I'm definitely not going to disrespect you. I ask the same. If you can give me that in return, that'd be appreciated. What I'm going to do is just give you some information. Right, I got my thing up there, yeah, I got a degree, and I'm a certified recovery coach and an interventionist. Um, and I'm the senior director of New England Medical Group, which is an organization right in Hingham. We do adult and um, adolescent mental health services, intensive outpatient programming. But at the end of the day, like, all I really am is a person in long-term recovery. You know, what that means to me is that I did make a lot of bad decisions. It was fun at first. And it just progressed and progressed. And next thing you know, I was like a full blown mess and I wanted to stop and I couldn't stop. And things just got really bad for me. So as a person in long-term recovery, I no longer drink alcohol. I don't smoke weed, I don't use any other substances. I don't misuse any prescriptions. Matter of fact, I'm not prescribed anything. And I've been that way since July 2nd, 2010. So I'm coming up on 14 years of abstinent, solution-based spiritual recovery. And I have a good life. I'm happy, I travel. I laugh, I dance, and I don't need drugs and alcohol anymore. And as a result of being in recovery, one downside of being in recovery is to see how many people struggle, and to see how many people die. We all know someone who's got an alcohol problem or a drug problem, someone who dies an overdose, someone who is so depressed maybe they ended their own life, someone who's still currently struggling with drugs and alcohol. And when I found recovery and found a way out, I just felt compelled and committed to get out there and talk about it. And I'm grateful that I have an opportunity to do that. So at a minimum, if this applies to you, then take what you want from it. But at a minimum, you probably know someone that maybe some of this information I'm gonna share with you, you can use to help someone else, right? I'm assuming some of you have already experimented. Some of you have already been approached. Some of you have been tempted. And if you haven't, that's great. But if you're going on to college or you're going into the real world in the workforce, someone is going to present you with alcohol or marijuana or cocaine or dads or some pill or something. It's just bound to happen. It's just inevitable. And my goal is to just give people information that when the time comes, you have some information to make a decision. Whatever you're going to do with that. I don't demonize alcohol. I don't demonize marijuana. You know, if you're a 30 year old person and you have a glass of wine after work and you pay your bills and you go to your kids' soccer practice, good for you. If you can do that in a responsible way, good for you. I couldn't. I drank like an animal. I used substances like a very irresponsible person. Things got very bad for me. Um, but it's not about demonizing. It's about, in young people, because science says our brain's not fully developed yet as a young person, it's like if we could just prolong that first time use, if we could just prolong that experimentation, then it drastically reduces the chances of it actually being a problem. So I know teachers, and by the way, thank you Hingham Cares for getting me in here. Thank you Melissa Cook for giving me the plug. Uh, thank you principal for the introductions and all that. Um, but like my thing is like, if we can prolong it, the longer we prolong it, the better chance you have of not becoming addicted. And I say this often and those fine people don't like this, but I say, go to college, get a master's degree. Call me when you're 25 and I'll buy you a beer to celebrate. It's not going to be either, but if you so desire to have a glass of wine or a champagne after you've got your master's degree and in your mid-20s with a fully developed brain, I won't scare you and demonize that idea because your brain can actually handle it at that time. I personally see no use for drugs and alcohol anymore, so I'm not co-signing or encouraging that. But this idea, just so you don't think I'm like this crazy dad, like screaming at you, trying to threaten you and scare you, it's not that alcohol is the devil, it's that your brains literally can't handle it right now. So if you wait, do what you gotta do, and then as an adult you choose to do that, then that's on you. You got a better chance of being able to do that in a responsible way. The science says, because the underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, young people that experiment, very often get out of control 
Not because they want to, not because they're bad kids, not because they're not smart, because of the brain. So that's like the snapshot of what we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna fly through some slides, I'm gonna share some information, but most importantly, I wanna make sure I leave at least five minutes at the end for you guys, because you guys know what's up. I'm old, I'm out of touch, I don't know if I'm relevant. Like at the end, if you guys can think about this while I'm talking, you guys are seniors, you're on your way out. If there's something I could do better, if there's something I should be talking about, if there's an idea that you say, hey, on my way out of hangover, this is the type of program that would be helpful to the freshman and sophomore as well. This is the information that should be shared. If you're not comfortable raising your hand, that's fine. Like, here's my information is up there on the last slide. Shoot me an email. Um, but I want your feedback. I don't want to be the guy that's just up here talking. Like, I, I want to be helpful and useful. And I think you guys know what's up and know what's needed more than most of the adults. And sometimes you're not always given the platform to to share that information. So if you're comfortable and you're willing, I'd appreciate any feedback at the end of how we could all as a community make more of an impact. Fair enough? Okay. Coolest kid in middle school. <laughs> all right. well, how did it all stop? How did I get here? How did I end up being the guy in Hingham High School talking about addiction? And for me, and this is not everybody's experience, some people experiment in middle school and high school and they grow out of it and they become functioning adults, it's fine. That's not what happened to me. I just started smoking weed in middle school. No big deal, just a little weed. It was all fun, it was all games. They brought the dare guy in. He's like, you're gonna die, drunk driving, rah, rah. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know what I'm saying? It was a big joke. Because at 14, my brain could not comprehend that it would ever be more than just a little weed on the weekend. It'll never be a problem. It didn't seem that it was something that was even possible, right? So no big deal. A couple of years go by, things are progressing. Now 17 years old, I'm smoking marijuana every day because I'm ADHD to the max, right? Can't sit still in my own skin. You can see me, right? You don't have to be a psychiatrist to understand. I am a 44 year old man with adult ADHD. I still have it, people. I'm still hyper. I can still be mad. I can still have a hard time sitting still. I've learned to, to pray and breathe and meditate and I've learned grounding <coughs> techniques but as a young person left untreated, I'm like, this is like the Tasmanian devil. I get all spun up. And when I found that marijuana in middle school, it kind of took the edge off, right? So next thing you know, I, I, got, I fell down the trap of always needing that weed just to take the edge off, just to take the edge off. And what started on the weekends became a daily thing. And then it was like heavy drinking on the weekends. Then it was like, next thing you know, people are like, oh, here's a Xanax. Here's a Percocet. Here's a Valium. Here's a Vicodin. Right now, after like three or four years of experimenting, I'm still having fun. And what happens is one of the dangers of early experimentation is if you don't have like an awful experience, God forbid you actually enjoy it, you become much more open-minded to trying other more serious things. And that's what happened to me. My mom, don't smoke weed, you're gonna die, rah, 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 I smoke weed. I'm like, oh, this isn't that bad. What else is she lying to me about? So someone's like, you wanna try Xanax, mushrooms, acid, mescaline, ecstasy, molly, whatever, I became at least willing to try it once because no one gave me science. No one gave me actual information. It was like, just say no. Why? Because we said so. No, that doesn't work for me. I don't like the because we said so thing. Like, give me an actual reason. Like, talk to me like an adult. Why? Right? And my thing is what I learned from much smarter people than me, it's because of the brain. It's because of dopamine. It's because of the limbic system. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Not everybody's experience, but it was mine. By 20 years old, I was full blown addicted to Oxycontin. By 21 years old, I was shooting heroin. And for the next nine years, off and on, I shot heroin almost every day. And everything that comes with that life. By the way, at 16 years old, I had a job. At 16 and a half, I was the first one of my friends with a car. I was the cool kid. My parents went camping in the summer. We had an open house, right? So I'd have parties at my house. I always sold weed because like, if you sell weed, you smoke for free. Thought that was a good idea. So I was like the cool guy, the fun guy, the guy with the car, the party guy, the ladies man, the wannabe tough guy. I was all those guys. And the next thing you know, I was full blown addicted to heroin. It was like, how did this happen? And now I want to stop. Now I'm going to detox. I go to detox and I'm like, I'm done, I'm done. This is ridiculous, this is not who I am. And I leave detox and my brain's like, yo, you need to smoke a little weed. Just drink a little beer. Take one pill. Don't do it three days in a row. You'll be okay, right? 
right? The next thing you know, I stopped dibble dabbling again. Days, weeks, and months later, I'm full blown addicted again. I couldn't shake it. I was on the methadone clinic for two years. I was on the clinic for three years. I was on psych meds. I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. I was just running around, shucking and driving, doing anything I could do to shake this thing, and I couldn't shake it. And as a result of bad decisions as a young person and addiction, by the way, I got in more trouble before I became full blown addicted than when I did. From 16 to 20, I, don't know, I was arrested like five times, disturbing the peace, fighting, shoplifting, breaking into cars, right? Drinking in public. Year to date, I've been arrested over 12 times. I got three DUIs. I was incarcerated. I turned 25 and adopted the House of Corrections. Stole all my family's jewelry. Got into recovery. Did okay for a little bit. Went back out. Stole it all over again. Been brought back to life two times with Narcan. I've overdosed three times. One time I just happened to come back to in my own apartment and I had a paralyzed arm for almost three weeks because I fell out on my arm. Shock therapy, electrotherapy, right? Um, acupuncture. I thought I wasn't going to get my arm back. Still didn't stop. And I've been jumped and I've been shot at and I've literally been stabbed in the back, punctured lung, hospitalized, and all that. I'm not trying to scare you because young people can't be scared because the part of the brain that's responsible for that is not fully developed yet. So I'm not even going to try to scare you. This is just my experience. It definitely doesn't have to be yours, but that's what happened to me. So I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be in recovery today. Like I defied the odds because a lot of people didn't make it out. <clears throat> so I do have to fast forward this a little bit because I can easily go down a side street on any slide because I'm super passionate about this. And I want to get specifically to uh, the emotional stuff and I want to get to the refusal skill stuff. Um, but I kind of already touched on this. How did this happen to me? Right? Insecure, low self-esteem. I was a late bloomer. I was the kid that like didn't crack six feet until after high school. So like I didn't have a little mustache and all my friends had mustaches, right? Shout out to the homies with no mustache if you're a senior, you know what I mean? Sucks, you get there, don't worry. Nothing to look forward to, shaving sucks, you know? So ride it out while your baby's soft right now. But if you have insecurity around that, I totally get that because my friends were becoming men and I was a really late bloomer, so that insecurity. Then I had two parents that were always at home fighting, always at home fighting. My father was a Portuguese immigrant. He had like a painting job, he had a fishing job. He always had these in, like, they just weren't consistent, inconsistent jobs. And mom was like the, grew up in a cushion it, leave it to beaver, lifetime movie network mom, glasses halfway full, rose colored glasses, life is what you make it, like just a good human. And dad was like a 1970s Portuguese immigrant, rock and roll savage, you know what I'm saying? So God bless him because he's in recovery today too. Thank you for that. Um, but I'm saying all this because people don't want to talk about it. Some of you probably have issues at home, some of you probably you know, have parents that have their own struggles and nobody talks about it, you keep it in the house. And what happens is people like me, I keep it inside and I bubble up and I go out into the world and act like everything's okay, but I gotta keep going back to that toxic home when my father's yelling at my mother and my mother's crying because she's not sure how she's gonna pay the bills and you just carry that around. So I had the family dynamic issue, I had the insecurity issue, I had the late bloomer issue. I got picked on in fifth grade. You know, I fell in love with this young lady in like sixth grade and she broke my heart, right? I had this weird, uh, just so many weird, creepy things happen as young people that we don't have to get into right now, right? But I had all these factors that left me in a place where I was already hurt and broken before I found substances. And this is one message that I have that's different from some of the other messages. But people are like, don't use drugs, don't use drugs, don't use alcohol. Well, people in recovery, just don't drink one day at a time. Just don't use one day at a time. Drugs and alcohol are not the problem for someone like me. The real problem is when I am dead sober, I have anxiety and I have depression and I have fear and I have hurt and trauma and disappointment and I have racing thoughts and I have irregular emotions. I was not okay without drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol, temporarily at least, made life just a little easier. Made, made me forget about the broken home. Made me feel a little taller, a little braver, a little older, a little stronger. Gave me a little more courage. And see, the, 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 the deceit with early substance use is if you have anxiety, racing thoughts, depression, trauma, pain, if you got stuff going on at home and you start to smoke or take dabs or, or you know, you're using edibles or whatever it is that you're doing to like take you out of that, 
The bad news is that will not work permanently. You will build a tolerance, your body will fight it off, you will not get the same desired effect, and you will find yourself over a period of years needing stronger and stronger things just to feel okay. And that's exactly what happened to me. Never wanted to be a drug addict, never wanted to make my mom cry. I just wanted to feel okay. And a little weed here and there did it, then it was a little weed and a little alcohol, then it was a little, a little weed and a little alcohol, a little pills, and just over the years, I just found I needed stronger and more serious combinations of things to be okay. And I kept crossing lines in the sand I never thought I'd cross. The only way to guarantee that you never become addicted is only one guaranteed way. Anybody know what that is? What's one guaranteed way to guarantee you never become addicted? Never start. To never start in the first place. Round of applause for this person. <laughs> It sounds silly, but like, it's really the only way to guarantee you don't become addicted because how do you know? I went to school with people that drank and got high and partied and some of them grew up and some of them died. How do you know who's who? You don't, often until it's too late. The only way to guarantee you're not that guy is to at a minimum prolong first time use as long as possible or just never use in the first place. So here's some statistics, you know, sad thing. A lot of people have died, man. I'm not trying to scare you, but this is just the last five years, over 10,000 people just in Massachusetts. Uh, it's over 20,000 in the last 10 years. And matter of fact, we, we just cracked an awful milestone in the United States this year marked. One million people have died in the United States of an opioid-related overdose. And by the way, most of them, I don't know what the statistic is, I won't say that most of them, not all of them are from IV heroin use. People are buying Xanax, Adderall, cocaine, all these different drugs, and it ends up being fentanyl, or carfentanyl, or xylazine, and they're dying. I'm glad I came early, I got to sit in the, you know, if, if we had only known, or whatever the name of that movie was, um, and watching that, it's just like a good kid that was in college that like drank a little and took a pill here and there, and one day, he mixed alcohol with a benzo, and he just didn't wake up. It doesn't have to be this tragic, dramatic, homeless, chronic, heroin addict thing for it to kill you. It could be a couple bad decisions, it could be the first time you ever take a pill in your life, someone gives you something, and it just happens to be fentanyl, and you're dead forever, right? So how do we not do that? How do we make better decisions? So addiction, the short version is, addiction is doing something over and over again, having a negative effect, and still doing it. I, when I talk to the middle schools and the freshmen, I talk about gaming, right? Gaming, people are addicted to video games, and they're obsessed, and they just can't wait to get back and it starts to affect their work, it affects their family, they're disconnecting from their friends, they're just chasing that gaming. And what you don't know is that you're actually chasing dopamine, right? And then social media and IG and Snap and all that obsession over, did they like my post, am I getting that attention? That's all dopamine, I wanna to get to that. So who's most at risk? Bad news, you all are most at risk. Anyone under the age of 18, if you happen to be 18, more bad news, you're still at risk because in the video the guy said the brain is not fully developed until 26. Anyone that uses drugs or alcohol before 26 is at risk to become addicted. If you have a mental health condition, anxiety, depression, ADHD, bipolar, you're more at risk. If you are prescribed a controlled substance for that condition and you experiment, you're even more at risk. If it runs in your family, you're even more at risk. And if you keep compounding those things, Oh, that makes sense now. I was ADHD, alcoholism runs in my family. I used at a young age. I had all these risk factors that I even, wasn't even aware of, that statistically I was more likely to become a drug addict than I was to become a college, college student, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't know at that time. So I challenge you, and maybe with your friends and family and people you talk to, if they're like thinking about playing with it, right? Look at your family tree, ask your parents. Do you have alcoholism and drug addiction in your family? Bad news, if you do, it's just like cancer. You're more at risk than little Billy that's got no addiction in his family. Right? If you've got anxiety, depression, pain, trauma, we'll get to that. If you've experienced any kind of trauma, and trauma doesn't have to be so heavy, trauma is trauma. Um, oh yeah, I gotta fast forward. Um, if you've experienced any type of trauma, you're at an increased risk to become full-blown substance use dependent if you experiment. And it makes a lot of sense, here's why. If you have pain, you don't wanna feel the pain. If you don't find a healthy way to deal with the pain, you may try to medicate the pain. So it's logical to say, the more bad experiences you've had, and the more pain you've had, 
the more likely you are to experiment, to seek relief from the pain. So for me, prevention work is not about scaring people. Prevention work is not even about saying, don't use ever in your life. Pre real prevention work is about helping people come to grips with and get honest with if you have anxiety and depression and fear and trauma and insecurity. If you're just like not okay in any way, let's help you with that. Because happy, healthy people don't use drugs. The best prevention work is to lift people up and empower them and love them up and give them resilience and refusal skills because healthy, well-adjusted people don't use drugs and alcohol. If you're like a stud athlete and you're like focused on college and your body's your temple and you're confident and you're proud and you're at a party and someone's like, oh, hey, let's do this. And they're all slippity dippity and goofy looking. You're like, oh, I'm all set. That does not look cool at all. I'm going to D1. You know what I'm saying? Because you're strong and you're confident and you're not afraid about what that person's going to think of you if you say no. Right? But people like me, anxiety, depression, insecurity, desperately craving everyone's approval, there was no bad ideas. I said yes to everything. I got in fights. I did reckless behavior. I drove drunk. I started fights at parties. Like I literally was so desperate to like get friends and like worried about what people thought about me. I had a hard time saying no. I had a hard time being my own person. So healthy, happy, confident people are less likely to make bad decisions based on peer pressure because you're less swayed by what other people think about you. So real prevention work, and if you think about it, you got young friends or young cousins or, or siblings, how do we love them up? How do we encourage them? How do we build positive, strong people so that they don't need relief from their life? Marijuana, just quickly, is not the marijuana that it was, right? I'm old, so the marijuana that I smoked came from like Mexico in a compressed brick format and looked like an old magazine or a phone book, you probably don't even know what that is, and like it was nasty. You had to peel it apart, you had to let it sit to like let it fluff up because it was so flat and compressed. It was full of seeds. Some of you smoked it, it gave you a headache. It was not high quality marijuana, okay? Now, with the legalization and the medicalization of marijuana, again, I'm not demonizing it, here's the reality, we have genetically modified, scientific, high-level THC marijuana readily available on every corner. So what does that mean? The weed that's out there now is not the weed that was out there before. And this weed is so strong, the THC in the weed, which actually is the thing that gets you high, not the CBD. People use CBD oils and ointments and pills. The CBD has been medically proven to help a lot of people with a lot of different symptoms. But the THC in the marijuana has no medical use. It just gets you high. And the THC in this weed and in these edibles and gummies and the dabs are so high and so concentrated, people are going into psychosis. Young people with no history of mental illness are literally snapping hallucinating, not in touch with reality, seeing things that are, not, that are not there, and getting locked up in psychiatric wards. And they do a full drug test for the animal on them, and it's just weed, right? So I, I kind of bring that on the parents. I get parents like, oh, my little son, little Billy, he just smokes weed, he doesn't do heroin. I'm like, listen, lady, I only smoked weed too. It wasn't a big deal when I was just smoking weed. But often people that smoke weed at a young age end up on other things, not to mention, the just weed is not the weed you smoked. This weed is crazy. It's strong. You know, it's, it's causing a lot of harm. So I just had to touch on that because even if you just, nobody talks about weed. Everybody's talking about cocaine and methamphetamine and opiates and heroin. Oh, you're going to die. How about you smoke weed once and you end up in a psych unit? That doesn't sound like fun. Alcohol, no big deal, just drinks alcohol. Everybody who drinks alcohol, it's a rite of passage. They'll grow out of it. It's normal on college campuses, blah, blah, blah. Okay, more bad news. Alcohol is a drug, and alcohol kills more people every year than any other drug, including heroin and fentanyl and carfentanil. Alcohol in itself is deadly. Now, I'm trying to scare you. If I get passionate, it's just because I'm passionate. If I'm yelling at you, I'm not trying to scare you. I just get fired up giving this thing. It's just a statistic that people overlook and don't talk about. They minimize marijuana and alcohol, when in fact, most people never get to heroin. It'll be the other things that we say are not that bad that hurt us or kill us or you know, get us in trouble. So how do they start? A lot of people get their first drug from a friend, some get it prescribed, and then the one thing that's important is 93% of people that use heroin 
or fentanyl reported they didn't start with heroin or fentanyl, right? So again, the idea of curbing early use and doing early interventions before it gets bad. And by the way, a statistic that surprised me, I grew up in a big city, I saw homeless people, I saw women work in the street, I saw a lot of rough stuff. And I always thought like, you bet it, Fall River, Rockin, Springfield, Lawrence, those people, those people are the problem. Well, of the one million people that have died in the United States from opioid-related overdose death, the largest demographic that's been impacted by those deaths are the 20 to 34-year-old white male from a middle-class family. It's not those project people, them homeless people from those tough cities. It's our people in nice communities, with good families, with proper education, that just make some bad decisions that can be fatal. You know, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you're black, white, young, old, rich, poor, going to D1, live in Hingham or live in Brockton. It doesn't matter. If you experiment, you just run in the risk. So we gotta talk about vaping. Some of you may be, some of you maybe not. This picture is awful, don't judge me, it's about all I can find. But vaping is the new thing. It's actually not even the new thing anymore and I want your feedback on this because I did a presentation at Plymouth North and I was like, vaping, vaping, vaping's bad. It damages your lungs, it increases your heart rate, it can cause you know, uh, cognition and uh, attention focus problems. And I don't know, I'm going on and on and on about vaping. And vaping 100% is bad. Uh, it has nicotine in it. Nicotine is the most addictive drug on the planet worldwide. And nicotine, you become very nicotine dependent. Without it, you have mood swings, you get anxiety. Like some people like literally can't wait to get out of class just to go vape. But the lady said, what we're finding now is we're finding pouches all over the floor. <laughs> right? You guys know? Zinzins, the old little zinzins, right? So people are getting caught up smoking and vaping in the bathrooms and getting suspended. So guess what? It's the next evolution. It's the next thing. Now everybody's doing the little nicotine patches. So, more bad news, as you can guess, they're not good for you. Side effects. There's a lot in here, but I want to get to some more of the juice. Look, side effects of nicotine, which is high concentration inside those little Zinbax and any other brands. Diarrhea, nausea, tremors, headaches, Sleep disturbance, heartburn. <clears throat> May include dizziness, headache, nausea, harmful to health. Bottom bullet. It may also have negative effects on the adolescent brain. So real quick, I actually blew right past the brain slides. It's probably the most important slides in the whole presentation. Brain development. Who knows what the prefrontal cortex is? Anyone. Prefrontal cortex. What does it do? Determines how you think and how you respond to fear. Round of applause. Give him a round of applause. But we focus on the prefrontal cortex as responsible for decision making, impulse control, and risk assessment, among other things. But the part of the brain that says, pause, don't do that, that's a bad idea, is not fully developed until the mid-20s. That's why young people are more impulsive, they live on emotion, they, they live on thrill, doesn't mean you're bad people. You ever do something super stupid, and right after, you're like, oh my God, what was I thinking, right? Right after. Because you know morally and intellectually the difference between right and wrong, but sometimes the part of the brain that says, pause, don't do that, it's just, in the previous video, it said, all the wiring's not there. There's no connection between the emotional part and the rational thinking part. And often, we just impulsively make bad decisions. So the danger, the real danger with nicotine and marijuana and alcohol at an early age is it compromises, stunts, and stops the development of that part of the brain. So what does that mean? If you start using it at a young age, you stop, stunt the development of the prefrontal cortex, you're more likely to make bad decisions, not evaluate risk properly, and exhibit poor impulse control. And I look at my life, and that is like exactly what happened. Young age, hyperactive, ADD, started using light substances, no big deal, more bad decisions, awful impulse control, zero willpower, no bad ideas. 
just having fun. So the scientific biological concern with nicotine, vaping, pouches, zins, marijuana, edibles, all of that, is it interrupts the healing part of the brain. Next, limbic system. Who knows what the limbic system is? Can't be the same guy. I respect you, but yes, no, 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 no. Limbic system, what does it do? The emotions of the brain. Round of applause. That's not actually the correct answer, but I appreciate your participation. Next one. Amygdala and the hippocampus in the limbic system. Round of applause. Also not the correct answer. Anyone else? Anyone else? What's the limbic system do? How about this? I'm going to give you a clue. It's also known as the reward system, the reward center of the brain. What does the limbic system do? Dopamine! Round of applause! dopamine that makes us feel good. The purpose of the limbic system and the dopamine is actually to keep the human race alive. So as cavemen, when we don't know what to do, the brain would release a chemical when we ate food that said, this is good, reinforce this behavior, eat more food, live. Laughing, exercising, making love with your significant other after college, <laughs> also releases dopamine, right? All jokes aside, you gotta eat, you gotta exercise, you gotta laugh, and you gotta have sex to make more humans. So, on a biological level, the brain is trying to reinforce behavior to keep the species alive. You guys with me so far? It doesn't matter if you want to or not, this is what happens. So here's the bad news and the connection with drugs and alcohol. Marijuana, nicotine, alcohol, release 2,000 times a larger burst of dopamine than laughing, eating, having sex, or exercising. So what do you think when the brain feels that big burst of dopamine rush through the body, what do you think the brain says? It says, do it again. Because the function of dopamine is to reinforce the behavior. So, not everybody, some people go and get a tooth pulled, they get one bite get in, they get nauseous, they throw up, they never want to do one again. Good for you. You had a negative reaction to an opiate, probably saved your life. Some people take a certain medication. Oh, I feel great. I feel normal. Their shoulders start to relax. That's the worst thing that can happen. Because that person's brain says, oh my God, this feels great. I finally feel normal. I want to do that again. The dopamine's function is to reinforce a behavior. And all of these, su these substances release huge amounts of dopamine, which by their design makes us want to do them again. It tricks the brain into saying this is a good thing for your survival, you should do it again. So if you experiment and you have a negative reaction, count yourself blessed, because many people very innocently experiment with things, and their brain's like, yes, that's the best. Can't wait to do it again. I remember being a young person, young, probably started smoking weed, I was 13. I was junior high school. I couldn't wait for the weekend when my older friends would have weed. I mean, I was talking about it on a Tuesday. I couldn't wait. Then it was high school, got into the heavy drinking, the party scene, you always had that one friend that parents are never home, right? That's the guy, big party this weekend. Wednesday, yo, Frankie, what's up, guy? What, what are we doing? I can't wait. Frankie's like, bro, it's Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm ready. You know what I'm saying? I was already thinking about who's going to buy for us. What girls are we going to invite? You know, what bed am I going to sleep in in his house when I get too drunk and need to pass out? And normal people do not obsess and think about alcohol the way that I did at a young age. At a young age, I couldn't wait to get that relief again. And as time passed, I didn't wait. It wasn't a weekend thing, it was a during the week thing and it just kept progressing and progressing. So if you identify at all with that mental obsession, with that feeling of relief, that's bad, that's not good. I, I strongly suggest you find a healthy way to find relief and, and deal with your symptoms because this could very well get worse for you. 
If you've never done a substance in your life and you identify with anxiety and depression and all that brokenness or whatever pain you're dealing with, I strongly suggest you talk to someone about it. Ask for help. Seek a professional. Get a therapist. Go to a group. Talk to the social worker. Talk to the, you know, the adjustment counselor. You guys got like a bunch of assistant principals and principals, people that actually care enough about you to bring in a team of people that can actually help you. The problem is stigma. We don't want anyone to know. We don't want our parents to know. Sometimes our parents don't want the other parents to know. We're embarrassed. We live in fear. What does this mean? Does it mess up my job? Does it mess up my schooling? There are laws in place that protect your privacy that if you need help, please ask for help. Don't suffer. If you want to look me up, my name is Kevin Rosario. You can find me on social media. You can find me on Google. I work at New England Medical Group. If you want to pass your parents' information along, I'll find someone to talk to you. There's nonprofits. There's recovery coaches. There's mental health people. There's inspirational people. There's churches. There's gyms. There's non. There's like volunteer opportunities. There's a lot of things you can do that I would suggest. Like, please do it. Because so many people just suffer in silence, right? Just an example, look at Robin Williams. Funniest man in the world. He got a comic for 40 years, always smiling, dying on the inside the whole time. And I can identify with that. I'd be walking around with my chest out, like I'm a tough guy, like I'm a playboy, like I'm a class clown, everything's a joke, can't scare me, I'm not afraid of anything, rah, rah, rah. Dying on the inside, broken, hate my family, hate my life, don't have a lot of hope for myself, but keeping that mask up. And that mask prevents healing, it prevents truth, it prevented me from being my authentic self. So if you identify with that, I get it, it's safe to stay with the mask, but it won't make the pain go away. The most brave people I know are the people that admit they have a problem and ask for help. So, I touched on this, but just to reinforce it, People with positive self-esteem are not as influenced by others. People with low self-esteem are more impacted by others' opinion of them, which makes them more likely to make bad decisions. So, I think self-esteem and building self-esteem is the most important prevention work we can do. And then, by the way, I know I'm old. It was hard when I was young, bro, back in like the 80s or whatever it was. Not everyone had a cell phone. There was no internet, imagine that. There was no IG. Like, I was insecure based on like the 12 people in my classroom. I compared all of my stuff to 12 people. You have 33 billion people living out there on the internet. Most of them are full of shit, you know what I'm saying? Excuse my language, sorry. I, I was really trying to make this whole thing without swearing. It's so unlikely, but I almost made it. Sorry to everyone that, that may offend. But it's true, they're all full of shit, you know what I'm saying? They got fake eyelashes, fake butts, fake boobs, Fake filters, men and women, by the way. These dudes are out here with calf implants. Come on, bro, go to the gym. The makeup? I've seen like people turn Gollum into a supermodel. You know what I'm saying? You bring them to the beach, they start melting away. Like, who are you? This is not the person I brought here. And I'm joking, but what I'm saying is like, if you're, a, if you're a regular guy, like I'm like a five and a half, I'm a solid six maybe, right? I'm looking on social media at this like handsome dude on his best day after he just won the lottery with a filter, right? And I'm like, shit, if I compare myself to that guy, I'm not okay. Nobody posts their troubles. Nobody posts their insecurities. Nobody posts the troubles that they have at home, right? And there is absolute black and white hard scientific data that proves there is a correlation between the more time people spend on social media increased anxiety and depression. Why? Because it's a fake universe, bro. It's fake. And it makes normal people feel bad about themselves. It makes adults compared to the Joneses. Oh, look at Frank. Frank's got a new Cadillac. Gonna have to go get the Lexus. Oh, it's Steve down the road. Got a 20-footer. Go, gotta go get a 25-footer now. You know what I'm saying? People live in this insecure, superficial world based on fakeness, and we're so concerned about what other people think. Me too, I'm not like judging society, me too. Desperately care what other people think, wanna keep up with everyone. And what ended, up doing, what ended up happening for me is I sold my soul, I lost my authentic self, 
And I became like so swayed and so easily controlled by media, which is a joke. You know the people I respect the most now? I respect the people that do not have to be fake. They do not compromise. They don't necessarily like what everybody else likes. They do their thing, they run their race. Some people will like me, some people won't. They keep it moving. Just be authentic. Just be yourself. Because you know what the truth is for me? I spent half my teenage life worrying about what people thought about me. And most of the people who I was so worried about what they were gonna think, the cool kids, the jocks, a lot of them are not doing well today. A lot of them died. Some of them were in jail. Some of them got low-level jobs and they're scraping by. You know who's crushing it? The weird kids. The smart kids that I picked on and made fun of who were a little goofy and a little awkward and maybe had acne and they were like super focused on their studies. While I'm running around trying to be cool kid of the year, this person was actually a good student. And you know what? By 30 years old, that person owned their own business, had beautiful cars, had a nice home, they're traveling, right? And I'm shooting heroin. I'm the coolest kid in the detox now, right? High school's hard, man. Anybody that tells you high school's not hard is lying. College is hard, there's a lot of temptation there. But if you can keep your head down and do your thing and get to where you gotta go, trust and believe, you're gonna stop making money and you're gonna have nice things. And not that nice things make you happy, but having a good job and having a good career makes everything just a little bit easier. So, my, my, my final message is, be your authentic self. Don't have to be what everybody else wants you to be. And my last thing I'm gonna leave you with is this. I'm sorry, it's like 28 past the right. Have a plan. Don't just say no and panic. If someone comes up and is like, do you want to use this? Have something preloaded. No, I can't. It runs in my family. No, I would, but like, I'm an athlete and I can't. Or, oh, I'm on medication. I just, like, have a plan. That way when someone approaches you, you don't freeze up. And at a minimum, if you're scared, you don't, you don't want to say no, tell your parents, buy a breathalyzer. Buy, buy a drug test. And you can blame me. Like, look, I would use that, but my mom, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, all right? She heard this dude, Kevin Rosario, speak. She thinks I'm gonna shoot heroin. She thinks I'm gonna die. There's breathalyzers all over the house. There's quick cups in the bathroom. She said, if I come home with red eyes during allergy season, she's giving me a drug test. And if I fail a drug test, the wi fi is gone. The iPhone's gone. The PS is gone. And your friends will be like, oh, dude, that sucks. And keep it moving. They'll leave you alone. It's an easy hour. That's all I got, guys. Thank you so much.